Good afternoon, and welcome to Van Andel Institute's first virtual public lecture of 2021 with a focus on depression. And so you're aware, as we get started, we will be loading the presentation up to YouTube following today's remarks. So if you do have issues or technological challenges, we will also be sending an updated link. My name is Brett Holloman. I'm the Chief Philanthropy Officer for Van Andel Institute, and I'm happy so many of you were able to join us virtually today. Just like all of you, we certainly miss being able to gather for events in person. But one benefit of virtual events like this, you can tune in from anywhere, and you don't have to worry about missing out on the latest updates and research coming out of our institute. Today, we have the privilege to hear from Dr. Eric Atchis from Pine Rest Christian Mental Health Services, as well as VAI professor, Dr. Lena Bruden. Together, they will discuss current trends and helpful resources for behavioral health, as well as share their research that suggests inflammation may be an important trigger for depression and might also provide critical new avenues for prevention and treatment. Dr. Atchis is from Pine Rest Mental Health Services, an associate professor for Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine as the director of the Division of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine. He is also the Behavioral Health Medical Director for Network 180, which provides the public health mental health safety net for more than 655,000 people right here in Kent County. And he has been an investigator on no less than 40 clinical trials addressing depression and schizophrenia. As a psychiatrist and a scientist, Dr. Bruden seeks ways to diagnose and treat depression and suicidality by studying inflammation of the nervous system. Her findings may lead to earlier interventions for depressive patients and for development of a new class of antidepressants that targets the immune system. Dr. Bruden also investigates how inflammatory mechanisms can damage nerve cells in Parkinson's disease. If you find yourself with questions during the presentation, please feel free to submit them via the chat function or hold on to them, submit them in the chat function when we begin the Q&A. We will monitor the questions and answers and provide an opportunity to do so at the end of today's program. Now, Let's begin today's program. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Atchis and Dr. Lena Brunin. Well, thank, well, thank you, very you very much for the very, very kind introduction, Brent. Brent. It's, it's uh, my honor to be with you this afternoon uh, to share some of the work that we've been collaborating on uh, at the Nandal Institute and also at Pine Rest. Rest. Um, as, um, you as you can see, see the, the title of my talk is Depression, Depression Recognition, Recognition, and Treatment. And what, and what I'll, I'll be doing over the next 20, 20 25 minutes is talking just a little bit about where we are currently with the treatment of major, major depressive disorder. What, what are, we are we able to do? How are we able to help people? And then, and then also to understand what some of the gaps are. And, um, and, then, and then I'll be turning it over to my colleague, Dr. Dr. Brendan, to help, to help address some of the, the, the new ways that we're thinking about depression. depression. Next, next slide. slide. These, These are, are my disclosures, disclosures. Um, and you and can, you can I, I, just, just the ones that I'll mention are the ones that are of relevance to today's talk. Um, I, have I have done, done some consulting for Janssen and received some uh, research support from them. From them. They, are they are the manufacturer, manufacturer of esketamine, which, which I will discuss briefly today. today. And then I've, and then also, I've also conducted a study of intravenous ketamine funded, funded by the National Network, Network of Depression Centers. Centers. Next, Next slide. slide. So people, so people have, have been, been talking, talking and describing the concept of clinical depression for hundreds of years. And if we, if we go all the way back to 400 BC, the, 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 the term melancholia was used to describe mental illness by Hippocrates, um, who many people think of as one of the founding physicians. The Roman physician Celsus in 30 AD described melancholia as being caused by a bile that was throughout, uh, you know, going through human bodies. The Anatomy, the Anatomy of Melancholy, which is pictured in the slide here, is a book by Robert Burton, which was the first English text devoted entirely to the study of depression, and it was published in 1621. So people have been thinking about depression and its impact on, on humans and human functioning for many, many years. Next slide. Here you'll, you'll undo, undoubtedly, undoubtedly recognize some of the people in this picture, picture but these are individuals who've been very public about their battles with depression, 
Um, and and some, some of them, them we've even lost to suicide. So you can see there, there's um, uh, Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain, uh, Robin Williams, uh, Mike Wallace, Kitty Dukakis, Terry Bradshaw, Brooke Shields. And even I include um, the Peanuts cartoon there. Uh, we have little kids, so we watched a lot of Peanuts these days. And uh, Charles Schultz, who developed the Peanuts, um, suffered from depression and, and was quite uh, public about that as well. But it's not just famous celebrities who suffer. Um, indeed, uh, all of us know somebody, if, if we haven't suffered ourselves, we know somebody who's grappled with uh, depression and, um, and has looked for answers. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Next slide. Okay, so how do we define a clinical depression? And the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for the Diagnosis of Psychiatric Disorders that's published by the American Psychiatric Association, defines major depression as four or more of the symptoms on the slide with depressed mood or loss of interest in doing things for more than two weeks. So things like problems with sleep, either sleeping too much or not enough, uh, diminished interest, so not you know, wanting to do the things that you would normally enjoy doing, feelings of guilt or worthlessness, low energy, problems concentrating, changes in appetite, either decreased or increased, uh, psychomotor agitation or retardation, so moving around more or just or staying in bed all day. Um, and then sometimes with severe symptoms, even suicidal thoughts. Um, so the first thing that when you experience symptoms like this, you may go to see your physician or um, your primary care doctor or a counselor, and they the initial steps are really to rule out medical conditions which might mimic clinical depression. There are certainly some, some uh, endocrine conditions, things like hypothyroidism. There are rheumatic conditions like lupus, um, uh, metabolic problems that can mimic depression. Um, there are certain medications that can also cause people to feel depressed. Um, levodopa, propranolol, even oral contraceptive pills, just to name a few. And that, for that reason, your physician may order a series of laboratory tests just to find out, you know, is there a medical explanation for what's going on uh, before we think about whether this is a primary psychiatric condition. And then I also want to highlight that there are stressors that we all face that can sometimes trigger these symptoms. So uh, the loss of a job, the loss of a spouse or a loved one, um, all of those things can sometimes be the, the stressor or the trigger that, um, that leads to the development of these symptoms. Next slide. Okay, so I, I now have to preface this slide that prior to COVID-19, uh, depression had become public health enemy number one. And I think um, you know, we're all in the throes of still dealing with COVID-19 and figuring out what our lives will look, forward, will look like moving forward. But prior to that, um, in January of 2016, the US Preventive Services Task Force recommended screening for depression of all US adults. So I know that when I go to see my primary care doctor, they ask me the, the PHQ-2 is what it's called. It's two questions about whether um, I'm having any depressed thoughts or if I'm having any thoughts of suicide or if I don't enjoy doing things anymore. And then if I answer yes to those questions, they go on and ask me a longer questionnaire called the PHQ-9 where they, they ask additional questions. So our healthcare systems here in West Michigan are doing this, they're screening for depression. In March 2017, the World Health Organization stated that depression was now the number one cause worldwide of ill health and years lost due to disability. So it, is, it has surpassed cardiovascular disease as the number one cause of ill health uh, worldwide. And in the US alone, the annual cost for depression are, are topping $211 billion per year. And that's in direct cost for care. That's also in lost wages. Um, that's in uh, absenteeism, presenteeism, so going to work but not being able to function very well. All of that has a huge effect on uh, our ability as a society to, to function. Next slide. Okay, so how common is depression? Well, it is present in all cultures around the world. And in fact, each year there are more than 300 million cases of depression uh, worldwide. So it is a huge, huge problem worldwide. The lifetime risk is about 16%, a little bit higher in women than men. And the median age of onset is in the late 20s. So this is a disorder that typically comes on fairly early in life. And um, it can then affect somebody 
throughout the course of their adulthood and into uh, older age. Um, it is heritable, so about a third uh, of uh, the risk for developing depression is heritable. Um, most individuals who develop depression have two or more episodes, 85%. And sometimes in the elderly, there's a condition called pseudodementia, where um, individuals may, because they're depressed, have difficulty concentrating, difficulty interacting, doing things they used to do, not really enjoying things. And sometimes we think, oh boy, you know, it, uh, is someone developing a dementia here? But it turns out it's really related to depression in older age. Next slide. Okay, so what are some of the things that we can do to treat depression? Well, um, guidelines recommend that if someone is having mild depression, talking to a counselor may be all that they need in order to, to uh, rebound from their symptoms of depression. Um, if the depression is more moderate or severe, we really do recommend a pharmacotherapy in addition to counseling uh, or, or psychotherapy. And I've got listed there a number of different uh, antidepressant classes. SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the first one on the list there are the most common antidepressants, um, but there's, there are a number of others. And then third on the list are somatic therapies, things like electroconvulsive therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, vagal nerve stimulation, deep brain stimulation, um, and use of new medications, ketamine and anti-inflammatory treatments, which we'll talk about in more detail later, are typically reserved if people are not responding to the first two types of treatments. Next slide. So what are some of the evidence-based psychotherapies that are available for depression? Well, there are things like cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, psychodynamic psychotherapy, problem-solving therapy, and acceptance and commitment therapy. They can be done individually or in groups. Um, sessions can be limited as in cognitive behavioral therapy, typically is 12 to 20 sessions or it can be more open-ended, such as in psychodynamic psychotherapy, which can go on for uh, many months or even years. The most important factor in uh, working with, uh, in uh, involving psychotherapy is that you feel like you have a good working relationship with your therapist and that you're confident that she or he can help you. So when choosing a therapist, I often ask, you know, does the age of the therapist matter? Does the sex of the therapist matter? Who do you feel most comfortable opening up to? That can be really important because um, you really wanna be able to have an engaging relationship with your therapist. And if it's not quite working out, if the relationship with your therapist just isn't quite a good fit, I encourage people not to be afraid to move on. Um, find another therapist, find somebody with whom you have a better connection um, because that's really, really important to the success of the psychotherapy. And uh, you're worth it. So I encourage people, don't give up. Uh, find the right fit for yourself. Next slide. In terms of antidepressants, this is um, a, a slide that shows the development of antidepressants over time. And our very first antidepressants were developed in the late 1950s. Uh, they were a class of medications called monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and they really were discovered by, uh, by accident. Um, these agents were being used for the treatment of tuberculosis, and some people noticed that they had an impact on mood. So they began to be used to treat depressive illness. They were followed shortly by what are called tricyclic antidepressants. Those also began in the uh, late uh, 1950s and early 1960s. And really, those two types of agents were the only things that were available for the treatment of clinical depression until the 1980s. And the most famous of the medications that came along in 1980s was, was Prozac or fluoxetine. And when that uh, came uh, into the market, it became a safer alternative uh, for treatment with medications. And since then, we've had a whole host of uh, similar types of medications that have been developed over the 1990s and into the 2000s. And then I wanted to just direct you to the end of the arrow there uh, to esketamine, which is really a novel medication with a new mechanism of action. And we'll talk more about that in just a little, in just a little bit, but um, one of the benefits or potential benefits of esketamine is that it works very quickly. And for all of the other antidepressants, um, it takes some time for them to, to have an effect. Next slide. Okay, so when I'm working with folks and treating them, uh, one of the questions I often get is, does efficacy vary among the different antidepressants? And um, 
the answer is, is that the best antidepressant for an individual is the one that works for them. And that sounds kind of uh, intuitive, of course. The problem is, is when you've got a dozen or more antidepressants to choose from, you don't know which one that is to start out. So sometimes what I will ask somebody is whether they have a family member who's been treated with an antidepressant. And if they have, was there a particular medication that they found helpful? And because of uh, the shared genetics that that person may have with their family member, um, it turns out that that might not be a bad place for us to start if there was a medicine that, they, that worked well and that they tolerated. We don't have evidence that antidepressants or anti-anxiety effects vary significantly with antidepressants in the same class. So if you try one SSRI antidepressant and it doesn't work, unless it was due to a side effect, it's less likely that another SSRI antidepressant will be helpful for you. So the way that we pick which, which SSRI to start with is based on its side effects. So some medications tend to make people a little sleepy or improve their appetite. And if those are symptoms that you're experiencing, then we might select that antidepressant for you. Other medications like Prozac tend to kind of pep people up or give them energy. So if somebody's really you know, struggling to get out of bed, that might be the antidepressant that we start with. And then the other question I get is about generics. And um, I would just say that by law and by testing, generic medications are equivalent to brand name medications and often a lot cheaper. So um, I do recommend generic medications whenever possible. Next slide. Okay, so how long should antidepressants be continued? Well, typically um, they should be continued at least six to 12 months after somebody has recovered from their depressive episode. So they're feeling down, they started their antidepressant, they started feeling better. And once they got all the way better, we still wanna continue the medication for a number of months afterwards. And that's just to prevent relapses. So uh, we know that if we stop the medication too soon, the rates of relapse are very high. Furthermore, if people have more than two episodes, so a second episode of depression or a third episode of depression, they are much more likely to have additional depressive episodes if they were to stop their medicines. So if somebody's had at least two uh, depressive episodes, I'm usually recommending long-term medication therapy uh, to prevent them from coming back. Next slide. Okay, so um, this is another question I get is, you know, I, I, been taking this treatment for a while, it worked for a while, and now it's not working anymore. And I'm starting to feel more depressed again. What should I do? Well, we recommend a number of strategies, such as increasing the dose. Um, usually we increase by 50%. Sometimes we double the dose. Um, augmenting with another medication to boost its effects. Um, sometimes using two different types of antidepressants is a strategy that we'll employ. Or if the current antidepressant really just isn't working, we may switch to another antidepressant. Um, and then finally, um, if we haven't already added one of the other um, approaches such as psychotherapy, we would certainly do that. We could think about somatic therapies or even phototherapy. Next slide. Okay, so with these approaches, how well are we doing? Well, this was the STAR-D trial, a large study funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health that did just what we talked about. It tried people on one medication and if they didn't respond, it moved them to a second one or a third one, it augmented in some aspects of the study. So it was very much a real world trial. And what they found is that with about a year of treatment and up to four different uh, approaches, up to one third, that red, red bar at the top still hadn't remitted from their depression. They hadn't gotten all the way better. So that's the unmet need. Those are the individuals where we need new treatments for um, better treatments, different types of treatments or approaches. Next slide. And this slide just highlights a little bit the gap there that I had talked about. So you can see somebody's mood is kind of declining over time. And then um, they start treatment where the pink and the blue lines intersect with the green line. Um, and using current antidepressants, unfortunately, um, their symptoms conti may continue for up to 10 to 14 weeks before they start feeling better. That's the pink line in the slide. And we really, we, we don't want that there to be such a delay there. We would like our antidepressants to work much more quickly. And that is really the hope for this next generation of antidepressants like S-ketamine or ketamine, IV ketamine that can be given where people feel uh, better within minutes uh, and sometimes hours. So um, new types of antidepressants that can address that lag are very important. Next slide. 
I'm going to talk very briefly now about suicide. Um, so suicide has been a growing crisis in the United States. This is data from the CDC from 1999 to 2016. And um, the darker blue is bad in this slide. So it means an increase of uh, more than 38 to 58% in the suicide rate over that time. So you can see Michigan there is um, uh, a darker blue, not the darkest blue, but the suicide rates in, increased in Michigan by 33% from 1999 to 2016. Now, most recently, we've gotten some data coming in that the 2019 uh, suicide statistics, we started to finally see rates go down just a little bit in the United States overall. And now, of course, we're very nervous about what's going to happen in the year with COVID and, um, and uh, how that might affect suicide rates. And we don't have the 20. data yet, but it was incredible. sharing a lot more about this, about how inflammation may be related to depression. But you can see there on the left-hand uh, part of the slide um, that, I'm sorry, I don't know if we're on the next slide yet. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Um, we can see on the left-hand side of the slide that there are symptoms of sickness. So when you or I get a cold or the flu, um, we don't feel good. We just want to stay in bed. We want somebody to bring us chicken soup. Uh, we don't, you know, we pull the covers over our eyes, we, we close the, the, the shades so no light comes in, we just want to stay in our bed and be left alone. Um, and that is really often how people feel when they're depressed. Uh, they're fatigued, um, they may be irritable, they're not interested in doing things. And so um, there's a question of whether inflammation may be contributing to depression for some individuals. Next slide. And we have some neurolog uh, neurologic basis uh, to think that this may be true. So um, the arrow on the left-hand side there talks about peripheral inflammation. So when we get sick, we have this response from our immune system. Cytokines are increased. There are these um, cells that go around and clear the infection, but they have an inflammatory reaction. And that's part of why we feel bad when we, when we develop an infection or the flu. Um, but those, that peripheral inflammation that's happening in our bloodstream can cross over into the brain and affect things like decision-making and impulsivity, uh, can lead to hopelessness and changes in our arousal and reward systems in our brain. And we think that this may lead to what we call cytokine-induced depression. And again, Dr. Brendan will talk more about that in her presentation. Next slide. I wanted to speak briefly about the impacts of COVID-19. So. Um, I think COVID-19 is a very um, uh, in, um, obviously devastating uh, um, illness and it can have both emotional and inflammatory effects on people. So this is actually um, a, a disaster recovery slide from, from SAMHSA. And it talks about this pre-disaster phase where we're learning about something new emerging. So um, this would have been say last year in February um, then we go through what's what's kind of a heroic phase where we're um, you know we're we're gonna get we're gonna get through this we're gonna we're thanking all of our frontline workers um, you know it's kind of a honeymoon phase where we're um, you know uh, feeling good or there's a lot of good emotion being sent out to people who are working on this and then we kind of as the pandemic dragged on uh, we reached this disillusionment phase where it's like oh my goodness you know I I can't believe I'm still you know, working from home and our, our kids aren't in school and all of these things begin to, to cause us to, uh, uh, to feel hopeless about the future uh, of the event. And then eventually, um, hopefully we're entering this reconstruction phase as vaccines are being rolled out and uh, we're returning slowly but surely back to a more normal life. Um, you know, we, we start to feel better again. And, and then the effects of the inflammation. So COVID-19 illness is a tremendously inflammatory illness. Um, there's increased cytokine, cytokines and inflammatory cells uh, that, are, that often occur in people's upper respiratory tracts. And there's question about how this may impact and affect uh, mental health as well. Next slide. One more slide uh, related to COVID-19 is that there was this interesting study done of a little over 7,000 adults hospitalized with COVID-19 in 39 Paris area hospitals. And what they found is that among uh, 345 patients who received an antidepressant within 48 hours of hospital admission, 
there was a 44% reduced risk of intubation or death. So again, this is, this is showing that there may be a link between inflammation and the ability of antidepressants, at least, um, to counter some of that inflammation. And I know uh, Dr. Brunnen will talk more about that as well. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, you know, if you or a loved one is facing clinical depression, um, I hope you'll be prepared to recognize some of the symptoms of depression, um, you know, not feeling like doing anything, uh, low mood, uh, reduced um, energy, um, and, then, and then be prepared to go get treatment. So um, don't assume that this is a normal reaction, even if it's a stressful situation. Consider talking to your primary care doctor, a, a therapist, a psychiatrist, um, and really then think about treating it aggressively. A uh, combination therapy is often the most effective, a combination of psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy. And this is maybe the most important thing is don't give up. Um, work with your doctor, let them know if a treatment's working, if it's not working. Um, they can only help you if you tell them you know, how things are going and whether it's working or not. So let them know how you're doing um, so that they can move to the next step if things aren't, aren't improving. Next slide. So this is um, a slide just for help in the local area. This is uh, somewhat specific to, to West Michigan, but um, certainly if you need immediate or urgent help, um, we encourage people to call 911, go to the nearest emergency room, or there is the Psychiatric Urgent Care Center at Pine Rest, it's pictured here. Um, you can call Pine Rest at the number listed there, their website is listed there. Um, for those without any insurance or with Medicaid, sometimes a good starting place is Network 180, their phone number and uh, website is listed. And really anywhere you are, if you want to learn more about um, uh, mental health and treatments, uh, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, is a terrific resource and they have many programs that are there to help individuals and families. And then I also added a suicide prevention line there, 1-800-273-TALK. And there is also a crisis text line. So if you text HOME to 741741, uh, people should be able to help you there as well. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, and I will turn things over uh, to the other presenters. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Eric, for that uh, first talk. I'm uh, Lena Brunden. I'm a professor at Van Andel Institute. And um, today I will talk about different causes of depression can be. And I will also let you know about some of our ongoing research. This is the Van Andel Institute building here in Grand Rapids, and we should have been there today but it's also really great to be present in the virtual world to, to talk to you. And if you haven't yet visited Van Andel Institute, I hope you can come sometime once the pandemic is over. It's a, a wonderful building and you can see uh, our laboratories down at the bottom of the slide too. So today I will talk about a couple of questions that are related to depression, including what actually causes depression from a biological perspective and how we can and perhaps how we should treat depression. First of all, what is depression? So depression is a disease that is only defined by its symptoms, like Eric told you. There are no current blood tests or other types of biological testing that can tell if somebody has depression for certain. And it, um, sorry, that was the, the previous slide, please. There we go. So the key symptoms of depressions are feelings of sadness, loss of interest in things that we normally enjoy, changes in sleep and appetite and fatigue. And I also wanted to stress uh, two important symptoms, the feelings of guilt and shame, because these feelings are sometimes not immediately recognized as signs of depression, but they can be very intense and painful. And um, also there are often dif difficulties in concentrating and decision-making. And if the disease becomes severe, there may also be thoughts of suicide or suicidal behavior. And in order for a diagnosis of depression to be made, the symptoms must have been present for most of the time of the day over at least a period of two weeks. And these symptoms must also have caused a reduction in functioning, such as the capacity to work or study or interact with others. <clears throat> 
So how frequent is this disease? You might know that depression is actually a very common disease. It affects over 15% of us, and there are over 300 million cases worldwide every year. And this makes depression one of the leading causes of disability worldwide. And it's a major contributor to the overall global burden of disease. One of the most severe consequences of depression is suicide. As many as 1 million people die from suicide every year, in our country alone, we have around 50,000 deaths from suicide yearly. In fact, suicide is the most frequent death due to an illness up until the age of 35. So what do we know about the causes of depression and suicides? Well, it is established that in most cases, several factors can contribute. And this is what we call a, a multifactorial disease. Often there has been a stressful or a tragic life event and that can coincide with some underlying traits. They can be inherited sometimes. And then additional biological factors can create a perfect storm that triggers depression. What are these biological factors that might tr trigger depression? The truth is that up until the 1950s, we didn't have much idea about what these factors could be. And patients with severe depression were often hospitalized in the large old psychiatric hospitals that you might have seen. Um, sometimes these hospitals were so large that they were actually self-sustaining towns where the psychiatrically ill patients could be kept separately from the rest of society. And one of the ways that depressive patients were treated in these days were by different types of shock. And this is something that I thought was very interesting and kind of creative, but also shocking. So on the picture, you can see one of these setups to shock depressive patients from an old psychiatric hospital in Sweden. And it's called a surprise bath. And you can see there is a bridge built where there is a trap door in it. And the depressed patient was then tricked to walk across this bridge to get some fresh air. And instead the trap was opened and the patient fell into the ice cold water. And the doctors were hoping that this shock would somehow awaken the patient from depression. And also very interestingly, al already in these old times, it seemed pretty clear to the physicians that there was actually something physically wrong with the depressed patients but I didn't know exactly what a harmful substance could be. So one solution in the old days was to try and kind of get rid of, of the body fluid that would contain something harmful. So they would try and make depressed patients vomit or they would expose them to bloodletting. And this was all in order to get rid of an unknown biological disease causing factor. But in the 1950s, something really important happened for the treatment of depression, and Eric already mentioned it briefly. So um, at that time, the doctors and scientists were desperately searching for a good antibiotic drug that could help against tuberculosis, which is a bacterial infection of the lungs, as you know. And when they tested an antibiotic called ipronizid, they noticed that the patients seemed to become much happier when the patients took this medicine and tested it some further in their laboratories, they found that if ipronizid increased the levels of the chemicals, chemicals called monoamines in the brain. So what are the monoamines then? Well, they are a class of chemicals that help the communication between nerve cells. So they're called neurotransmitters. And dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline are all examples of the monoamine neurotransmitters. And because ipronizid increases the levels of these chemicals in the brain and seem to help against depression, the common theory about what causes depression became the so-called monoamine theory of depression. In other words, people must be depressed because they have too little monoamines. And this uh, scientific theory dom dominated depression research for uh, half a century. And after this discovery, basically all medicines that have been produced to treat depression are targeting the monomines in different ways. And the most commonly ones used that you might have heard of or even tried are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, abbreviated SSRIs. And there are also other medicines that target noradrenaline and dopamine neurotransmission. 
But is that the whole solution to the biological causes of depression? It is true, like Eric said, that some patients that take the medicines acting on the monoamines respond really well. But unfortunately, also quite a few do not get completely well. And depending on how many different medicines tried, the response rate to these medicines can be said to be around 50%. So could that mean that there are also other biological mechanisms involved in depression? Looking back at ipronaiacid, the medicine that effectively seemed to make people more happy, it is true that it is an antibiotic and it kills bacteria by destroying their cell wall. And it's also true that it is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which is the reason why the monoamine levels go up. But these are not the only effects of this drug. So it turns out that ipronaiacid actually also is a potent anti-inflammatory agent and it can reduce the stress levels in cells. So could perhaps some of these additional effects also be involved in its antidepressive effects? So what is inflammation and how could it be involved in depression? This is the research topic that is the focus of my laboratory. And uh, inflammation, as you know, is the body's response to injury or damage. It can be in the form of a wound, as in this picture, or a virus or a bacteria that attacks and damages your body. And then your body will respond by sending immune cells that secrete inflammatory factors at the site of the injury. And those factors are called cytokines, and they help signaling for immune cells and ultimately removing the threat from your body. And you can feel these inflammatory factors as an increased temperature, fever, and also locally when a site of injury is red, warm, and hurting. So what happens when these factors reach to the brain and act on the brain? For some years now, we have named how we feel during an illness for sickness behavior. So sickness behavior is the common name for emotions and behavior that we all have experienced during, for example, the flu. And they include depressed mood, changes in sleep and appetite, and so on. Um, interestingly, almost identical to the symptoms of depression that I mentioned just in the beginning of this talk. And the only uh, difference between sickness behavior and depression is that in sickness behavior, there is usually fever and other signs of infection, and the symptoms are often short lasting. So could it be that inflammation actually causes depression? In 2009, my team was the first to measure the inflammatory factors called cytokines in the cerebrospinal fluid directly surrounding the brain of patients who had attempted suicide. And we found that suicide attempters overall had more than double the amount of inflammation in the form of uh, the cytokine interleukin-6 in their cerebrospinal fluid. And if we looked at the patients with depression among all these who had attempted suicide, the levels were actually more than three times higher than the controls. So this led us to believe that we were onto an important biological mechanism. And we kept asking ourselves, could inflammation be particularly important for suicidal thoughts and behavior? Around the same time, other researchers showed that the anesthetic drug ketamine that Eric also mentioned had positive effects in treatment resistant depression. Interestingly, it also has a fast and striking effect in reducing suicidal thoughts. And the anti-suicidal effect comes already within minutes or hours. And you might have seen that about a year ago, FDA granted ketamine approval to be used clinically for treatment resistant depression. Now, ketamine is a very different type of medicine compared to the drugs acting on the monoamines. Ketamine is an NMDA receptor antagonist, which means that it blocks glutamate signaling in the brain. And glutamate is a completely different class of neurotransmitter. And we thought that was very interesting because we had started to study some of the downstream effects of inflammation, which includes the activation of a metabolic pathway called the kynurenine pathway. And since then, this pathway has become our major research interest. The uh, kynurenine pathway increases its activity during inflammation, and it consists of a series of enzymes that produce metabolites. These products of the pathway have very specific effects. And interestingly, one of them, quinolinic acid, which we call quin as a nickname, 
is activating the glutamate receptor, which is the same one that ketamine actually blocks. So this led us to believe that inflammation increases glutamate signaling in the brain via the kynurenine pathway. And maybe ketamine is effective because it's rapidly counteracting the effects on Quinn on this glutamate receptor. So next we went on to measure the levels of Quinn in the cerebrospinal fluid of our patients. And we found that the levels were almost three times as high um, as in the controls. And uh, the levels of Quinn were actually extreme in some of our patients. And as many as half of the suicide attempters had higher levels of Quinn than the highest level in a control. If we now assume that inflammation acts on our brains by the inflammatory factors called cytokines that next generates metabolites that increase the glutamate signaling in the brain, what is it in our bodies that actually causes this inflammation in the first place? And one of the factors we have looked into is the gut. And I'm sure that you have heard that an inflammatory environment in your intestines can spill over into the blood and that way even impact your brain. And we published together with our Swedish colleagues evidence of a leaky gut related inflammation in patients who have suicidal behavior. Another factor that can um, uh, impact the degree of inflammation in our bodies um, is actually if we don't have enough of some important vitamins. And in this study, we found that patients who attempt suicide have very low levels of vitamin D. And vitamin D is very important because it helps us control and regulate the inflammation in our bodies. And it's generated from being in sunlight, for example. Third, like I mentioned before, infections such as viruses and bacteria can of course increase inflammation in our bodies. And right now, my group is looking at three different virus infections, including herpes simplex virus, uh, which is the virus responsible for cold sores. And we have just finalized a study at Pine Rest where we assess patient symptoms before and after a cold sore flare up. The second type of infection that we're studying right now is infection of the liver, such as hepatitis C. And we do this together with a very prominent virologist in New York at Rockefeller Institute. And his name is Charles Rice, as you can see on the photo. And he was actually one of the winners of last year's Nobel Prize in medicine. And the third in, in, uh, infection that we're interested in is the coronavirus infection, like Eric mentioned. So we have observed that COVID-19 leads to a very strong increase in IL-6, the cytokine that is also important for depression. And it also increases the kynurenine pathway activity. So um, my team is, of course, now very concerned, together with many other researchers, that maybe some patients will develop depression and suicidal thoughts in the long term after COVID-19 infection if these biological changes remain. The final factor I just wanted to mention briefly uh, that can cause inflammation in our bodies is actually pregnancy. And the placenta has a very high expression of cytokines and kynurenine metabolites. And therefore, pregnancy could be a time when a woman that's sensitive to inflammation might fall ill with depression. And we have just completed a large study of depression during and after pregnancy together with the Pine Rest Mother and Baby Program and Spectrum Health OBGYN high, here in Grand Rapids. And I will just show you one slide with the data that we have published. So here you can see that women with severe and suicidal depression in the postpartum uh, have higher levels of the inflammatory cytokines IL-6 and IL-10 in their blood than women who are not uh, depressed in the postpartum. This slide is a summary of some of the different ways that we can help counteracting depression. And uh, I, uh, I have talked about uh, most of these today and Eric also mentioned some of them. And uh, many of them, as you can see, act by reducing the amount of inflammation in our bodies. What are my take home messages for you? First, I think that knowledge is very important. If we know that inflammation can affect behavior and emotion, we have a chance to feel and be more powerful. Just the knowledge is helpful. And uh, then we can be observant. We can ask ourselves, is there something in my life that might lead to inflammation and could be a cause of me not feeling well today? 
And because we can act, actually counteract some of these biological factors, we can actively try and help ourselves uh, make feel better. So for example, we can reduce inflammation by eating better, by exercising, by sleeping and getting enough vitamins. But then again, we also have to realize that that might not be enough. Sometimes the biological changes are, are too hard for us to counteract ourselves. And um, we might need to talk to others, first of all, about how we feel. We need to reduce the stigma and talk about depression with uh, our friends and acquaintances. And there are so many that feels the same way. So there is absolutely no need to, to suffer by ourselves. And then, like Eric told you, there are many different treatment options for depression. Um, uh, so it's important to seek professional help, even if it's something that feels difficult, try and do it anyway, like Eric said, because you're worth giving yourself that chance. And I would like to uh, finally bring you some hope because there are many, many researchers working on this and by developing better treatments for patients with depression and suicidal symptoms. And right now there are several anti-inflammatory medicines in clinical trials for depression. And we hope that some of them will be approved for uh, depression in the coming years. This is my team. And some of them work on site at the Institute right now, analyzing blood samples from patients at Pine Rest, but also many other hospitals around the country. And uh, we collaborate very closely with our team at Pine Rest Hospital at the main campus. So to the right of the slide, you can see Leanne, Bill and Joe, who are uh, very busy with our patient recruitment and evaluations. And finally, I would like to acknowledge the large amount of lab members, colleagues and collaborators locally at our hospitals in Grand Rapids, as well as all over the world that have contributed to our research over the years. And thank you so much for everyone listening today. Dr. Brunden and Dr. Atchis, uh, we can't thank you enough for the knowledge and compassion that you bring to a really difficult subject. Uh, to begin our question and answer today, uh, I'm curious, uh, what drew you into the idea of clinical work and research in the space of behavioral health and specifically depression and inflammation? Dr. Atchis, we'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, Brett. That's a great question. Um, I think for me, it's uh, there were a couple of graphs I showed with, uh, and Dr. Brunden talked about it too, but the people who aren't getting better with currently available treatments. Um, for me, that's the most powerful motivator. If I'm sitting across from somebody and I'm trying to help them and they're just not feeling better yet, and I'm, I'm doing my level best and they're doing their level best to feel better and we're still not getting there, um, that tells me that there is real unmet need and we need to investigate more. We need to understand this disease better. We need to understand what causes it um, and what, treat, what new treatments we might be able to develop so that um, we can help each and every person uh, get better. Thank you. Dr. Brunin, what drew you into this area of research and clinical study? Yeah, I have, I have been really interested in the human brain and the human soul ever since I was very little. So I knew from very early age that I wanted to work with the human brain. And the reason why I became interested in inflammation was actually I was looking at microglia cells uh, when I was a graduate student, I was studying Parkinson's disease, and we looked at a type of immune cells that are present in the brain that are called the glia cells. And I could see how reactive they were and how they were really triggered by different stimuli. And at that time, it wasn't really considered that the brain could respond really strongly to inflammatory stimuli. But just by looking at these cells in the microscope made me think, wow, I wonder, I wonder if these cells can act, you know, can change how I feel somehow. Fascinating. So one question from the audience, um, and feel free, if you've got additional questions, feel free to type those into the chat function. We'll have a chance to answer as many of those as what we can. Uh, but a quick question, uh, do either of you feel or what are your thoughts on uh, prescribing antidepressants? Do you feel like they're being overprescribed or underprescribed? What are your thoughts on that? Dr. Atchis, we'll start with you again. Yeah, I, I mean, I hope they're being appropriately prescribed. So, you know, that's, that's my hope. Um, antidepressants are used to treat depressive illnesses, but they're also used to treat a whole host of other conditions, most specific, 
most specifically or most commonly anxiety disorders. So um, a lot of times people with symptoms of anxiety or depression are prescribed an antidepressant by their primary care physician. There are lots of other conditions that can also benefit from antidepressants, um, things like obsessive compulsive disorder, um, uh, just to name another one. And um, so I think they are used quite frequently, but I, I hope they're being used appropriately. Um, certainly if anybody is having concerns, they should talk with their doctor. And if they're not sure that they're getting the right answers, then check in with a psychiatrist and see what they think about uh, the medications that, you're, that are being prescribed or taken. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Brendan, any additional thoughts to add? Yeah, I think it's really important to know that we have these different classes of medications and that the chances are, are still pretty high that you will respond well to them. It's not 100%, but if you try, at least you give yourself the, the chance. So I would definitely, myself, I, I would definitely try an antidepressant if I would have severe symptoms of depression for sure, absolutely. Of course, and then you might need to try a second one, but I would do that as well. And I think we have a, a very well and thorough, you know, a thorough clinical protocol, how to proceed when testing these antidepressive treatments, so. Great, thank you. So regarding medication management, Dr. Atchis, you mentioned uh, that there can be a loss of effectiveness the longer you're on or a patient is on uh, medication. Is there any research uh, that, about proactive management that you increase uh, dosage rates prior to them beginning to lose their effectiveness within the body? Um, thoughts and, and reactions to that? Yeah, um, you know, there are dangers with prescribing medications at too high of a level. You know, if we go beyond what somebody needs, they may experience more side effects. So my, my general approach when treating somebody is to try to find the minimum dose that's necessary to help somebody get all the way better. And if we can do that and get them all the way better, then if those symptoms creep back in, we may be able to increase the dose. There's some room to go with that particular medicine that has worked well, that we can get the symptoms back under control. So I tend not to try to uh, you know, anticipate when that might be, unless somebody has a very clear seasonal component to their illness. So they may say, you know, every fall or winter, I start to get more depressed. Mm -hmm. We may then think about increasing the dose of their medication um, as they approach that particular season. But um, I really, in, in an effort to maximize benefit and minimize risk or side effects, I try to find the lowest uh, effective dose for someone. Dr. Brunin, any research that's being done so that we can uh, test both efficacy and uptake within the body and uh, that sort of thing. And a lot of the work that you're doing could potentially help what we call in the space of personalized medicine. You know, Dr. Atchis, you showed a slide early on in your presentation that it can take 10 to 14 work weeks before a medication can take effect within the body. Um, how does your work relate to that, Dr. Brunden? Uh, that's a really good question. So uh, the field of personalized medicine that you mentioned is something that we have a lot of hope for for the future in psychiatry, because currently we kind of tend to treat all depressive patients according to the same protocol and we, you know, change medicines, but we haven't really identified a group of patients that might actually be the ones that need anti-inflammatory treatments. And I think that's really what we need to do. We need to look at the different groups of patients. Can they have a different set of biological factors? And can we help them better by picking the treatment that's best for this particular group of patients? So that's an, an area that we're working on actively at this very moment. And we have a lot of hope for that in the future. That's encouraging. So that long-term we could look at medications uh, rather than trial and error we might be able to run blood tests that would be able to predict uh, the way a medication might work within a person's body. That's very encouraging. Dr. Atchis, you've used uh, a language today uh, called a depressive episode. Can you say a little bit more about what do we mean by an episode? Yeah, thanks, Brett. That's a great question. Um, yeah, so the way that we define a depressive episode is when people have had those symptoms that both Dr. Brundon and I talked about, depressed mood, low energy, 
um, you know, anhedonia, not wanting to do anything, when those symptoms have lasted for two weeks or more, we would then define that as a depressive episode. And what we often see is that sometimes people will, you know, be feeling badly for a while, then they'll get treatment and they'll start to feel better again. But then over time, that depression comes back and they have a second depressive episode. So their mood goes back down for two weeks or more. So that's really how we define each depressive episode. And as I mentioned before, the more numbers of depressive periods like that that people have in their life, the more likely they are to have subsequent ones. And the, you know, often the better it is for them to remain on some sort of treatment to prevent them long term. Um, does that help? That, yeah, well? that helps. And I think a follow-up question that I have for that is often if you're the individual maybe struggling with depression, it can be difficult to see or actually feel some of the depressive feelings or tendencies. And it might be easier for a friend or a colleague or a family member to be able to see that. How does a family member or friend help someone that they might see uh, struggling with a, a depressive episode, as you put it. And I'm going to leave that. I'll start with Dr. Brunin. Uh, maybe you can provide some insights, and then Dr. Atchis will let you uh, follow up as well. I think that's a great question, too. And I touched upon it a little bit when I talked about feelings of guilt and shame, for example. I think it's really important for family and friends to recognize that a friend of yours or a family member might not present to you and say, I feel really low, I have a really depressed mood, but there might be other signals that you might see. And um, thinking of uh, my study in depressed mothers, for example, in depression after having a baby, that's when women can feel an intense feeling of guilt, guilt of not feeling, you know, strong enough love for their baby or not being a good enough mother. And those feelings are so strong. So they're not primarily maybe feeling a depressed mood, but they're feeling this intense guilt. They might not want to tell it to anybody because it's so incredibly shameful. Mm -hmm. So it's just important to keep this in mind that depression is not just about primarily low mood. So keep your eyes and ears open for other types of symptoms too. And also some signals like a friend who doesn't answer the phone much anymore, who doesn't want to come to go for a walk with you. It's really hard to detect that during a pandemic, of course, because there might be other reasons why people want to stick to themselves. But usually somebody who's depressed might not want to come with you for a run. They might not want to go out to a restaurant because they just don't feel that they're good enough in social context. You know, they feel worthless and they just feel like you would do better without them. So keep the lookout for these kind of different symptoms and signals. Yeah, and I would add briefly, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. I would add briefly too, if you're a family member, you may notice both the beginnings of symptoms worsening and you actually might notice the beginnings of symptoms improving before the, the person with depression does. So um, they may be getting out of bed a little bit more or taking a shower or getting ready to start their day. Those are good signs, um, you know, it, as their depression is lifting. And they may say, yeah, my mood isn't any better yet, but um, they're showing that they are beginning to have a lifting of some of those, we call them neurovegetative symptoms of depression. And um, those are good signs. And conversely, if somebody had been doing well, and then they're not getting out of bed, they're not showering, they're, they don't want to do things like they used to. Those can be signs that the depression is setting back in and they can be early warning signs to, hey, you know, call your therapist, call your doctor, um, let, let's get help now before it gets worse. So uh, our last question, um, how do we bring the conversation into the greater public space? So I think we've gained confidence in being able to talk about diseases like cancer or heart attacks and cardiovascular issues. Depression and behavioral health seems to be one of those that we still tend to want to sweep under the rug, either, either as an individual or family or um, thoughts on how we continue to have helpful and informative dialogue around the issues and challenges that we've talked about today. Dr. Atchis, I'll let you start. Okay. Uh, well, I think having discussions like this is uh, a great way to start. I mean, 
we all know somebody who's struggled with depression. Uh, we may struggle with it ourselves. And to have the ability to talk about it, I think is really, really important. You know, being from Grand Rapids, this is the home of Betty Ford. And, and she talked about difficult things several decades ago. She talked about addiction. She talked about breast cancer. And we have uh, models for us about how to do this. And I can think of people in our community who are doing it as well. Uh, Christy Buck with the Mental Health Foundation. Uh, we think about I Understand. There's lots of groups that are beginning to open up and, and talk more about this. And I think that's just absolutely so important and it's wonderful to see. Absolutely. Dr. Brunin? Yeah, I agree with that. And I think it's very positive to see the increased conversation about depression in our society. I think we should all keep standing up for people with depression or other mental health issues. And uh, there, there are many examples of people who, you know, might even tell somebody who finally comes out and says that they have depression, that they're not telling the truth. We see that, at, you know, examples in, in everyday media. And I think that's, can you imagine after waiting for a very long time and feelings of shame, you finally let people know that you feel suicidal and then people will tell you that you're lying. So we need to, you know, accept and help and stand up for our friends, our colleagues and other people in society who, who tells that, you know, that they have these symptoms and stand up for them and help them and keep the conversation going. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, I would sincerely like to thank uh, Dr. Atchis and Dr. Brunden for your presentations, your insights, uh, your passion for the, both the research as well as the clinical care. Our community is better because of each of you and our global world is better because of each of you. And as our folks who joined us online today, I would like to thank you as well for taking the time out of your schedules to join us and for sharing your own interest and in the passion for science and for research and the power of knowledge and discovery and maybe walking away with new language to be able to talk about these challenging issues that face uh, us as individuals and us as a community. These events and the Institute's work are not possible without support from a passionate community of supporters and sponsors and advocates like many of you gathered here today. I invite you to stay active and engaged with all of the great work happening at Van Andel Institute. Please feel free to visit our website at vai.org. You can sign up for our mailing list for future public lectures that we'll be hosting throughout the year. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram, any avenue that you can engage with to continue your learning about our latest research and education initiatives and many of our science-centered events. Once again, just a reminder, this uh, particular event will be recorded on YouTube and be published after the event. So if you find it compelling to share with friends or family, feel free to do so. Whether virtually or in person, I certainly hope to see all of you again at an event in the near future. And we thank you from the bottom of our heart for attending again today and for being important members of the Van Andel Institute Extended Family. Have a wonderful rest of your day.